Hey, it's Jessica Honiger, founder of the socially conscious fashion brand, Noonday Collection. Welcome to the Going Scared Podcast. Welcome back to the Going Scared Podcast. You guys are amazing. Whenever I'm having a bad day, I know exactly what I'm going to go do. I'm going to go read the reviews on iTunes for this podcast. I have to admit, you guys brought some tears to my eyes, and it just is a testament to this community of women who is lifting one another up. Thank you so much, and if you want to go leave another review, you just head on over to iTunes, click review, and that helps us appear on the iTunes radar so that more people are going to get word out about this podcast. So today's episode is a really special episode because I am introducing you to someone that you may have never met. Her name is Jenny McGee, and Jenny is the founder of Starfish Project, which is an organization that works with exploited and trafficked women in East Asia with the goal of empowering them to begin new lives. Starfish Project is going into brothels, and they're reaching out to women who are living in really um, horrific situations. I actually went and visited Starfish Project about three years ago and was just really moved at the commitment that the entire organization has to see vulnerable women emerge out of sexual exploitation and become the woman they're meant to be. Many of the women that they have worked with have gone on into careers to become professionals in so many different areas and in so many different career opportunities. And so I really was excited to bring you her story today. So some of the things that you're going to hear about are what life looks like for a girl who is actually in a brothel and how Starfish uses the principles of marketing to go into brothels and basically market these women away. I'm really excited because Noonday Collection is actually partnering with Starfish Project and we have brought our first ever 10 karat gold plated charm collection to you. And it's a beautiful collection. So I definitely want you to go and check that out. You're also going to hear about how to grow an organization, find a mentor, and build something that lasts, which is something that's really important to me. I feel like we're in this day and age where people think there's overnight success, overnight Instagram followers, overnight revenue for your business, but really success is primarily about not quitting, and you're going to hear that from us today. Can't wait for you to give it a listen. Jenny, welcome to the Going Scared podcast. It's great to be here. So this is so fun because I first met Jenny around three years ago when I traveled to Eastern Asia. And at the time, Noonday was scouting out new groups to be able to work with them. And specifically, we really wanted to work with groups that worked with vulnerable women. And I was so inspired by you and by how well your organization is being run and by some of the issues that you guys are going after in a really empowering way. And so New Day is so excited, guys, that we are partnering with Jenny's organization. It's called Starfish Project. And it's our first ever exclusive line of 10 karat gold plated charms where your story share her story and we've been working on it for probably two years now <laughs> <laughs> and so she's our newest partner and honestly just someone who's really going to inspire you guys so jenny i would love for you just to get to share a little bit more about starfish yeah. Um, well, Starfish has been running for about 11 years now, and um, we're in Asia, and we really work to help exploited and trafficked women and girls. And um, we, we try to help them experience freedom, establish independence, and develop careers. And um, so we regularly are visiting women in brothels and getting to know them, build relationships, and really trying to just offer them, you know, the chance to experience freedom and they can um, come into our program. Um, we have women's shelters for women who are in need of that. And then um, we also try to just help them to gain their independence through trainings, through um, 
through our counseling programs. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have deep wounds, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. emotional hurts. And so we try to have mentoring and um, just help them through counseling and things like that. And then through developing careers, we just really try to get the women, um, not only making the jewelry where all the women come in and initially they're making jewelry, but we also try to use the business as a platform for them to to learn those higher level business skills. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the women are involved in accounting side of the business or the sourcing. Um, we also have women doing graphic design. All of our product photography is done by girls who've come through the program. Mm. So seeing them not only make jewelry, but be able to do all the areas of the business, even marketing and um, watching them be able to do things beyond what they ever expected that they could do. Yeah. I mean, to really see them as leaders and I'm sure, you know, you and your staff have been some people who probably have believed in these women for the very first time. And it's so powerful what happens when we're believed in and that we have the power to believe in someone else and unlock sort of their own potential. I'd love for you, because I think we use the word brothel and I don't know what comes to mind, especially for those of us that have never been to Asia. So I would love for you to walk us through the life of a girl um, in a brothel. How does she get there? And then tell me about a transforming experience. Um, someone I'm sure immediately pops into your head right now of a woman who has gone from brothel to now owning her worth as a leader and is now um, a high contributor to your organization. Yeah. Well, for us, it looks different in different contexts. Brothels can have, you know, different, different atmospheres. And um, so that can vary anywhere from, you know, one girl in a little, in a little like closet like space. And often they sit in front of a glass window and men will come and visit. Or sometimes they're like in a massage parlor. Sometimes there's multiple women in one location. Um, but like I said, we're often seeing a lot of young girls there too. We're visiting regularly 12, 13 year old girls working in the these places. And so it's just really um, hard to see. And um, for me, it really came out of a place of building relationship with them. When I um, I started, I had been living in Asia and I, I started visiting with the women and getting to know them because I started to see a lot of girls working the streets and was just wondering how we could do something to help. And, and when I started hearing their stories, I was really shocked. Um, you know, a lot of them were coming from very poor villages in the countryside. None of them were from the city where I was at. And, um, you know, they'd come from homes where no running water, dirt floors and, and, um, and most of the time they hadn't had any education. A lot of them were making money and they were sending money home so their brothers could attend school. Mm. And um, I think that was just heartbreaking to see that, you know, in the villages, because they were girls, they had no value to their families and their only value was to contribute so that their brothers could go to school. And, um, and so I think, I think for me, that's where Starfish was really born to mm -hmm. see, you know, they were really there for economic reasons and so we needed economic solutions. That's right. And um, and so, yeah, we started our business to help meet that need. Okay. So walk me through the um, when, let's say, a girl gets introduced to Starfish Project. What is her journey to exit that lifestyle and then grow into a leader? Yeah. So we start right away. Um, you know, most of the women are living in the brothels. And so when they come out, they need a place to live. So we have a safe housing for the women. Some of them have children and we try to reunite them with their children. Um, a lot of them have children that are off in the countryside. and So maybe they've seen them once a year. And so we try to get them living together again. Um, we have so we have women in children's homes. And then um, but then as soon as they come into our program at the office, we try to um, do assessments right away and see, you know, what are their educational levels? Because we have some girls who can't read and write in their language. And um, and so um, we'll also do medical assessments and see if they have any medical issues that need to be addressed. Um, but then we really develop an individualized growth plan with each girl and kind of based on her education levels, her needs, um, how she's doing emotionally. Um, and we try to really... Um, really target, you know, how can we help this girl the best way for this girl? And, um, and so we'll start with a literacy program if, um, if she can't read and write in, in her language. And so, so we have literacy training. Um, and then once the girl's um, literacy level is high enough, we do computer training. And all of our girls get certified through the Microsoft, uh, in Microsoft programs. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's huge for them, because mm -hmm. you can imagine girls who never had any education or a lot of 
of our girls around second grade. And then all of a sudden they get a certificate from Microsoft. I mean, that is just huge, huge. for them. They'll cry. We have a big um, graduation ceremony when they get their, wow. when they get their certificates. And, um, and then through that program, they really learn study skills. They learn comp to, um, self-esteem, confidence. And, um, and then they really have the ability to succeed in, in other classroom settings. And so once they've gone through those computer training programs, we'll help sponsor them to study outside of Starfish. Mm -hmm. And so then that's where we've had girls study graphic design, photography, accounting, and they'll go to these training programs outside of Starfish. And so they can really use those skills within mm -hmm. Starfish to... Um, you know, they can practically use those skills in the work environment. And um, so when they're ready to leave Starfish, they have a portfolio, mm -hmm. they have real skills that they practiced and used, and we can recommend them to other companies. So our goal really isn't to have them work at Starfish forever. We mm -hmm. really want to train them up, see them come to a healthy, stable place, mm -hmm. and then have real skills that they can take to the outside world. Starfish is just kind of a means to an end in right. a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's and, cool. And for them, a lot of them say, you know, it's the first family they've ever really known. Mm -hmm. And so even girls who left, they'll come back and visit regularly. And we have, you know, social media groups that we chat on and girls will still stay connected for a long time because that's like their family. Wow. Okay. So when I visited you three years ago, I remember we were commiserating both founders, both hustling hard, both passionate about seeing change come to vulnerable people, both moms. <laughs> and I think we were just like, how do we do this? And <laughs> yeah. so tell us a little bit about your family life and what has been your journey to sort of um, own your your job, your role as um, as a founder of this organization, and also your role as wife and mom. Yeah. Well, it's been interesting. I have three kids. They were all born in Asia, and um, and I love being a mom. Um, one of my kids also has special needs, so that also adds its challenges living overseas and trying to find the right support services. And um, but that's also really had its blessings too. And just um, seeing my kids grow up in another culture where their friends are from all over the world. And um, there's just a lot of exciting things about growing up overseas. Um, but I think like all moms, it's that challenge of figuring out how do you balance your career and your family. And, um, you know, I've had many wrestlings over the years with that, <laughs> but I think um, I've just seen that I'm a much better mom when I'm also you know, pouring myself into into my career and these women that were helping. And and now my kids are getting older. They're um, 12, 9, and 8. Okay. And so they're really starting to understand um, Starfish and what we do, and they're excited about it. And um, I spoke last year somewhere. It was the first time my 9-year-old, he had really heard me share from my heart about Starfish. And afterwards, he came up to me and he was crying. And he wow. said, Mom, I had no idea you were helping so many people. Wow. <laughs> and um, that was really touching for me, too see to see him also get a vision for it and now he'll come in sometimes and help the girls um, box stuff up wow. and he loves to help out there and, um, and a lot of those women are aunties to my to my children mm. and they know them well they play with their children and that's awesome yeah I, I've heard that phrase that so much more is caught and not taught yeah. and I think we don't understand how much our kids are catching just by watching us just by having a model of, you know, someone who is just actively um, working and sort of being intentional about making an impact. And so I think when our kids are young, we don't, my kids also are eight, nine and 11. So super <laughs> close in age. And I think I'm starting to, to see that as well. Like, I think my narrative used to be like, I'm ruining their lives because I'm not around <laughs> as much as like most other moms that I'm around are able to be there, you know, I mean, you're, you've traveled from Asia to America to, to be with us this week. And, and it's just, it, I think I had a narrative for so long that I was screwing them up. And now that they're getting old, I'm like, Oh no, actually they're catching some things from <laughs> <Yes>. this. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe this is benefiting them. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's yeah. True. And I find they're incredibly flexible and um, quite independent. <laughs> so there's a lot of advantages I think they have as well. Yes. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more too about growing an organization because you started out with, I, I feel like bleeding heart, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just I had like no business experience. Bleeding heart. 
no business experience. And so how have you bridged that gap to go from bleeding heart to now running a thriving organization? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. I was a literature major in school. Um, <laughs> my entire experience in business was I worked in a factory to pay for college, <laughs> wow. which has actually come in very handy, though, because I learned a lot about the production line and how that all works, which I never thought I would use. <laughs> but it's it's um, been incredibly helpful. But um, I think for me, it's really been surrounding myself with people who know more and just trying to learn as much as I can from people who have different skills in different areas and having mentors and um, different different things, whether, you know, I have a business mentor, I have a spiritual mentor, yeah. I have a, a parenting mentor, and just having different people I can look to and say, like, this area, I want to, I want to grow more and be more like this person. But also knowing that one person doesn't have all the skills. And so finding different people who are, who are good at different areas that I need to grow in and, and then really just seeking counsel from people and um, trying to build a great team. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really come, especially as we've grown now, I see my role much more in, you know, finding great people and encouraging them, supporting them to do their job well. Mm -hmm. And um, so you don't have to know everything yourself, but right. just surrounding yourself with a great team and spreading that vision and then getting them really released into their giftings and I love at. that. I love that. And I feel like some people could listen right now. And I think two things are really helpful. First of all, there are no unicorns, right? You <laughs> yeah. just said that, you know, you've got someone that's helping with your spiritual growth, someone helping with your business growth. And so, but I think also a lot of people are waiting for someone to like invest in them. Right. Like some women are, are like, well, I wish I had a mentor. How did you go about seeking that out? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've had quite a few mentors and every one of them I've had to pursue hard. And um, even my business mentor now, um, he has never once called me and said, oh, let me give you some advice. Yeah. If I write him and say, hey, I've got this question. I don't know what to do. Can I talk to you? He'll be on the phone within 24 hours and we live on the other side of the world. But um but I, it takes me initiating and really pursuing those relationships. And then I found people are so willing to help you. But I think people are busy and um, and I think people don't want to push themselves on you. And um, so so I think you really need to seek them out and yeah. take the initiative. I think that's so true. People want to be sought out. And I think that for some reason, as women, we are afraid to ask sometimes for help. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> That's true. But I found when you throw yourself out there and like step out of faith, you kind of have no choice. You have no <laughs> choice, right? That's yeah. kind of what going scared is. It's going, it's saying yes without knowing the rest. <laughs> That's true. Okay. So you've developed a lot of courage over the last 11 years. Probably you look back maybe to your first year to now, it's like your courage muscles are pretty buff at this point. So what is keeping you continually stretching yourself and challenging yourself and growing your leadership? Yeah. Um, well, I think constantly trying to learn and grow. Um, this year, I've taken my first business class awesome. ever. <laughs> so 10 years in, I thought, well, I should study business. <laughs> but, um, but just, you know, just pushing yourself and even um, ha running a business and having kids, I can only take one class at a time, but just doing those little steps and keep um, continuing to grow. And then, and then I think prayer for me is a big part, mm -hmm. um, you know, having a strong spiritual life. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and then, like I said, having those people around you who can encourage you and spur you on. And, and when you feel down, you know, they can push you forward and speak truth into your life. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So I know that there's probably sometimes are hard. <laughs> <laughs> I bet I can only imagine some of the challenges <laughs> yeah. over the last few years. What has kept you committed to this vision? Yeah. Um, well, I think for me, I'm really privileged in that every day I work directly with the women we're helping and, um, and then they help me. I mean, I learn so much from them every day. And, um, so, so like even one of the women who does all of our product photography, you know, she came out of the brothels herself and, and now we talk all the time, um, about, about the products. And, um, and so, so I think a lot of people, you know, they are, 
maybe they work for an NGO or nonprofit, but they're in an office somewhere and the people that they're helping are far off mm-hmm. somewhere else. And so for me, I get to see these people every day mm-hmm. and um, I get to see them come in sometimes with severe PTSD mm-hmm. and, um, and they can't even work with other people because they've just had such severe trauma. And then watching those little steps of watching them grow and change and even little things like seeing the girl who could barely talk to anybody. And when I walk in the office, she's like, hi, Jenny, how are you doing? And a big smile on her face. Wow. I mean, even those little things, they're um, just so encouraging. And it's transformation, to. like like tangible transformation you're seeing every day. Right. Yeah. So I feel so privileged to get to see yeah, every day. Yeah. And um, I think that's a real honor. It is an honor. I remember when I came to meet you a few years ago to explore a potential partnership and I was like looking around, I'm like, okay, do you have enough people? I mean, are there going to be enough people to produce our, our orders? And I said, well, what, what do you do if, if there's not, and you said, well, we, we kind of create marketing campaigns and we go into brothels and we market women out. And I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, like I'm sold. Like, yes, we have to do that. We, we have to bring more rescue to more women. What are some of the complexities you're dealing with? Cause I feel like we kind of of, um, toggle back and forth between, you know, you described a, a woman in the village that's doing this for economic reasons, but then we use the word trafficking. Can you help sort of bring some clarity to the definition of, of trafficking? Yeah. So, um, well, what we see it, um, where we're at a lot is a lot of the women are really being tricked into to working in the brothel. So they don't know what they're getting into when they arrive there. And so that is really one big component of okay. trafficking um, is, you know, that idea that they're tricked or coerced in some way into working in the shop. But but we also do see some women who people would say have chosen it. And um, I, I struggle with that because I see we um, we have women who they have no education. They, mm. they haven't ever, we have one woman who's never been to school a day in her life. Mm. And so she said, you know, she came to the city being told she was going to get a job. And when she arrived, she found out she's supposed to work in a brothel. And she said, you know, I can't even become a waitress because I can't write down what people mm-hmm. are going to order. Mm-hmm. So what is she going to do? And she's, you know, 30 hours by train from her family. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I think, you know, people's definitions can vary greatly right. about it, but, um, but I've seen even in situations where you think people have chosen, it, I think you only choose that because you have no other options. Right. You know? right. And then we also see a lot of kids who are left behind. And that's uh-huh. a big issue where we're working. A lot of parents are migrating to the cities to work and the children are left behind in these villages. And so, um, we have one branch where the entire branch is all these girls who have been left behind by their parents. Mm. And so at 12 or 13, they need to go out and figure out how to survive in the world. Mm. And so they're really orphaned. And, right. um, and then they end up in these brothels because they're just trying to feed themselves. Okay. And, um, so tell me this, have you ever been part of actually shutting down a brothel? Um, we, uh, we usually see, um, well, we, we've gone into a lot of areas that have eventually get, are getting torn down or, okay. or closing up. And so we'll see, it's a very transient community. And so there's areas where they will, um, you know, we'll be working in there for a long time and then, and then they get shut down. Okay. And, um, and so, so yeah, it, I, what we're doing isn't necessarily the rescues like you would think of where like we're going in and like grabbing people and taking right, them out. Right. I think, um, you know, we go in and build relationships with the women. And a lot of times it's not like um, some of them are ready to come out, even mm. if they are given the opportunity, um, just because they don't trust you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they were tricked by their own family members to end up in this brothel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so when you come in, especially like some of us from overseas and you're from the other side of the world and you say, oh, I want to help you. I mean, why would they believe? That, right. That doesn't even make sense. And, you know, we have one girl who's worked with us for quite a while now. And recently she said to me, you know, Jenny, um, the day I met you, we, I met her in this cafe. Another girl had introduced me to her and um, she she brought her to me. And so I met her and she said, you know, that day I, I kind of thought you were going to traffic me again, but but I kind of had nowhere else to go. So I just wow. decided to come with you. Wow. And I thought, how crazy. This girl thought I was going to traffic her and she still she came. came. Because that was the best option she wow. had. It was better than her current option. Yeah. So, wow. so I think that tells you a bit about their yeah. situations and just the desperation that's there. And so where the area where you're working in, 
are you there? There doesn't seem to be a strong culture where the owner of the brothel is like, no, you can't come in. Like there is a sense where you're allowed to sort of develop these sort of relationships with the girls. Yeah, um, it is very interesting. Um, and um, we have one woman who's come out of the brothels herself and now leads our outreach programs. And she just has no fear. And um, so she'll often just go into these situations and be like, don't worry, I'm just here for a few minutes. I won't bother you. And she goes just kind of head to head with these bosses. Um, but then also, I think as um, she, she's a local person, but I think as the rest of us as um, Westerners going in, um, I found there's still this idea idea of politeness and not wanting to like lose face. Sometimes I think we're allowed in just because it would be embarrassing to kick out to say no. (laughs) Yeah. And so, um, but we really try hard to build relationship with the bosses too. And so if we can build relationship with those people, then we have a lot easier time to connect with the women. And so, um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but, um, we even had one boss one time who called me and said, you know, Jenny, this girl in here, she's not going to survive this place. And I think she's going to die here. So can you come get her? Wow. (laughs) That just blew my mind. I never thought that a boss would call me and ask me to help. So, um, but we had worked hard to build this boss's trust and, and we were straightforward about what we were doing. And, um, but, but I think, um, especially for the female bosses, a lot of them came from that lifestyle themselves. And so they can be a little bit more compassionate. Wow. That's really incredible um, because you're not demonizing the bosses, but instead you're seeing them as part of what could be the solution and creating a space of compassion for them as well in hopes that that relationship can eventually bring transformation. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. Tell, let's close with a time where your heart was like beating out of your chest, afraid, (laughs) and you just went anyway. (laughs) <laughs> well, I think even um, even just starting Starfish, I knew at the time, you know, if you offer women um, a chance to start a new career and, and offer them a new home, and that is a huge commitment you're making to these people. And you can't just one day say, well, you know, I'm kind of tired. tired. I think I'll go home now. <laughs> you know, I knew I'm committing big time to these people. So, so this is like a, I mean at least a decade kind of calling, if not a lifetime kind of calling. And so, so I think just, um, yeah, just making that decision was huge. And, um, I, I labored over and visited people and talked with people and kept trying to like find other people who would lead it that I could help out. (laughs) um, But in the end, it was just something I knew, like I, I couldn't forget about it. It was just on my heart and, you know, um, just felt like this thing that wouldn't, wouldn't go away and I couldn't just forget about it. Wow. And so, so I think for me taking that first step yes. was, was the hardest. Okay. Always that first step is the hardest, but, but because um, once you take that step, I say courage actually corners you. <laughs> yeah, you are then true. fully cornered by courage <laughs> and it's, it's not escapable, you right. know, but in some ways that it's almost nice after that because you're like, you know what? I've committed. Right. And I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So something's got to happen. <laughs> it's got to happen now. <laughs> and I found that in the end, a lot of it comes down to perseverance. You know, yes. um, something doesn't work and you try the next thing. And I, I think Starfish could have failed so many times along the way, but I think we've just had a team who's committed to, you know, if that didn't work, then we try the next thing mm-hmm. and try the next thing. But <laughs> I think that's a big part of, of success is just not quitting. <laughs> not quitting. <laughs> so true. A big yeah. part of success is just staying in the game, man. Yeah. Just stay in the game. Yeah. Okay. True. Well, I think we'll end with that because I think a lot of people have this perception of success and it's like unicorns and rainbows, you know, mm-hmm. but really success is simply not quitting. <laughs> That's true. So <laughs> let that inspire you guys today. Thank you so much, Jenny. We're so excited about um, just just doing this uh, journey together now. Yeah, we're so excited too. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So now that you're in love with Jenny, you have to go to Noonday Collections website and check out our storyline collection. So when I launched this podcast just last week, I heard from a lot of listeners already, which was so fun and encouraging to hear. And if you have any feedback, any guests you want to hear, drop me a DM on Instagram because I read all of my DMs and I just love hearing your suggestions. 
One of those suggestions came from a very new entrepreneur. And one thing she said was so many podcasts for entrepreneurs or people who want to have a social impact feature people who have made it, who have had the grit, maybe many women who have been like Jenny, who've been at it a while, and now they're sitting on top of a successful organization. And what she said to me is, could you please feature some stories of people that are just sort of starting out and that are in the messy middle and don't even know if they're actually going to make it or not. So I said, well, why don't you share your story? So I wanted you to hear from Christy Hayes today, who started Be Strong Story. Here's what she says. What I'm learning is that starting something, pursuing something that matters is going to be fearful, period. If you are doing it right, it's going to be a little scary and uncertain every single day. I'm experiencing that we have to be gutsy about the things that we really care about. For our family, it's spreading a message to the rest of the world. To say world sounds even too much, too big, too audacious. But in my heart, that's what I dream. The message is something that came from a simple lunchbox note my husband wrote my son. The days of note writing in my kids' lunchboxes were definitely over. The fact that they even had something of sustenance in their lunch anymore was a small miracle. So I asked my husband to do the lunches and maybe write a note since mom has slacked off for a little bit. Holden, our first grader, had been struggling on the playground with a friend. He came home crying, and as we were navigating this, my husband spoke wisdom to him through a simple lunchbox note that ended up changing our family. It said, be strong, protect the weak, love everyone. It became our family mission, and now it's our company. Our why is that we encourage people to live this out but it's also the heartbeat of the way we do business. We employ homeless to screen print our apparel and partner with a company who employs women who are survivors of sex trafficking. Our heartbeat is to use this message to change the world. Change the world? Sounds daunting and scary, but what if we really believed we could do that? What if I believed in our message so much that every day I knew I would have to show up with courage and boldness because our mission mattered? Would I do it? Would I do the things I'm not qualified to do, the things that I have to research and spend hours on, the things that may feel like they aren't really making a difference? So far, yes. We're in the trenches, in the hard startup process and messy middle because it matters that much. Things in our past experiences can be our best teachers. My past has shown me everything is figure outable. Making mistakes is not the end of the world. Most people will give you grace for a redo, and the word no, although it honestly stings like crazy, is a yes somewhere. Sometimes the way we displayed guts and courage in the past surprises us for what we do in the future. I remember almost 10 years ago working in Washington, D.C. I was newly married to a Secret Service agent, and we were heading to the nation's capital. I'm not sure if I wanted to be Reese Witherspoon and Legally Blonde 2, where she wears the cute stilettos and the pink suits, but I thought, we're moving to D.C. I think working on Capitol Hill in the White House could be fun, not knowing one thing about how government or Congress worked. I remember receiving a job for a nonprofit I wanted to work for and remember sitting in meetings with senators and aides at a table who were making big decisions where I was supposed to help advise them. I literally would be Googling definitions under the table of words they were using that I was supposed to know. I remember one word, researching, whitehouse.gov for kids. For kids, y'all, on my free time. I remember asking people who were smarter than me a whole lot of questions. No one really knew I didn't know what these big words meant, but I figured it out. I was shaken in those stilettos many times, and many times I might have done the wrong thing, like when I didn't recognize the new Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, and denied him access to the bathroom. (laughs) But through the uncertainty, I came out on the other side with a job I loved. It mattered to me, and I was willing to do the scary work to figure it out. Our past, the courage we have demonstrated in a tragedy or a trying time, or the persistence we've shown all comes back to us. Little by little, the courage to put myself out there again on behalf of a vision I see for our family, my children, and our world helps me day after day when my stomach is in knots. The courage is going to come to you too. Show up and do it, even when your hands are sweaty and your stomach tightens, even if you hear a no or make a mistake. 
I'm going to show up every day and surround myself with friends who tell me to do it, even when it's hard and unbelievably, ridiculously scary. Because for me, sharing the message of be strong, protect the weak, love everyone matters that much. I just loved her sharing this with me. And you guys, she just started this organization just a couple months ago. I've been wearing one of their sweatshirts around. You might have seen it on my Insta stories. I also just love this idea of going back to our why and having a huge vision. I actually scribbled out the vision of Noonday Collection when it was just me, myself, and I meeting in a bathroom office, you guys. And you know what I wrote on that vision? I said I wanted Noonday Collection to be the world's largest fair trade, handmade direct sales company in the world, that I wanted the artisan partners I had just begun working with in Uganda to explode and be able to run a business as a mission in their country, and that eventually I would impact thousands of women lives here in America. I had no right writing this vision down. It was audacious. It was somewhat ridiculous, but it was in my heart. And now you guys, thanks to you, it is absolutely coming to pass. Don't be afraid to just go ahead and write out a big audacious vision today. Don't base your vision on what you think is possible. Base your vision on what's in your heart and go for the impossible today. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll see you on next week's Going Scared podcast. Thanks so much for joining me on the Going Scared podcast today. If you like what you heard in this episode, be sure and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and leave a review so other people will join the conversation. If you'd like some behind the scenes looks at my life as a CEO, a mom, and a courage catalyzer, be sure to follow along on Facebook and on Instagram at Jessica Honiger. H-O-N-E-G-G-E-R. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.